Dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'm the Director of the Engineering Global Development Team at ASME, and also serve as the President of Engineering for Change. It is my privilege today to welcome you all to this side event of the seventh annual Multi-Stakeholder Forum on Science, Technology, and Innovation for the Sustainable Development Goals. At today's event, we will dive into the topic of preparing the future engineering workforce to achieve the SDGs through multi-stakeholder engagement. Today's event was co-organized by our long-term partners at the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth with the support of an incredible group of collaborators. I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to the UNMGCY for co-designing the side event and collaborating with us over the years. Today's event will be documented by our colleagues at UNMGCY and key recommendations and actions will be integrated in the follow-up report MGCY sent to the STI Forum co-chairs. We're also deeply grateful for the support of our founding organization, ASME, whose president is joining us today. We have assembled an incredible panel of change agents from our ecosystem of collaborators. I'd like to thank you all for your partnership and advocacy for the role of science, technology, engineering and innovation in creating a cleaner, healthier, more sustainable world for us all. This webinar will be archived on the E4C site and our YouTube channel for access later. Both of those URLs are listed on this slide. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, do please contact the A4C team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And if you're following us on Twitter today, do join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag. Now, before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about ASME and Engineering for Change. ASME is a nonprofit membership organization which was established in 1880 for enabling collaboration, knowledge sharing, and skills development across all engineering disciplines. With more than 90,000 members in over 135 countries, ASME is a truly global organization. ASME is also a standards development organization, having delivered more than 566 standards governing everything from screw thread dimensions to nuclear power plants. All of this is unified by a mission to advance engineering for the benefit of humanity. Dating back to the United Nations Millennium Development Goals over a decade ago, ASME recognized the importance of science, technology and innovation in sustainable development and the unique roles that engineers needed to play. At that time, ASME investigations found that, unfortunately, engineers were largely disconnected from global development efforts, limiting potential impact. And we responded with a portfolio of programs and platforms to address this gap. We welcome the announcement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. The SDGs represent a unified framework by which the global community is addressing humanity's greatest challenges, and they are not exclusively for developing countries or underserved communities. Simultaneously technical and social in nature, the SDGs require high impact solutions, a technical talent pipeline prepared to engage effectively, as well as infrastructure and public leadership to drive implementation at scale. This consensus underpinned the first STI forum held in 2016. The challenges we face today collectively cross borders and are well beyond the scope of any individual, company, industry, sector or government and is becoming increasingly obvious to both those within, within and outside of our profession that engineers are vital to achieving the SDGs. For significant progress, we need to build on the progress we've made and continue to drive systemic change, cross-sector engagement, regulation, and government action. This requires that engineers and other technical professionals across all sectors and disciplines are trained at much faster rates and equipped with the platforms, networks, and knowledge to be at the decision-making table. As an ecosystem enabler, we assemble forums such as today's event to connect the diverse sectors and actors to chart the course together and engineer a better future for us all. At ASME, we have been dedicated to addressing sustainable development issues for over a decade through our engineering global development team, which I am proud to lead. To meet the UN's 2030 agenda deadline, the EGD team is fiercely focused on building the workforce of the future, ensuring improved engineering engagement and technological stewardship. 
We do this through an ecosystem of platforms and programs delivering knowledge, convening academic institutions, researchers, engineering associations, private sector, NGOs, and multilateral agencies around the world with a shared vision to unify around the SDGs and pursue concrete joint initiatives and expedite progress. We are steadfast in our belief that as SDG 17, Partnership for the Goals underscores, no one country, organization, or individual can achieve these results alone. As an example, I want to highlight how we are training future practitioners and social entrepreneurs focused on hardware-led social innovation. ASME Social Innovation Accelerator, iShow, matches social ventures across the globe with the design services, engineering expertise, and financial support they need to successfully take physical products to market and achieve positive social and environmental impact. Since 2015, our regional events held annually in Kenya, India, and the United States have enabled over 180 startups from more than 30 countries to solve quality of life challenges for underserved communities worldwide. Our experience with the iShow has shown us the significant potential of social enterprise in improving the lives and livelihoods of vulnerable populations. It has also made us keenly aware of the challenges faced by social entrepreneurs. To overcome these hurdles, the iShow Accelerator delivers technical and strategic guidance to social ventures based on four key pillars, customer and user knowledge, hardware validation, manufacturing optimization, and implementation strategy. We match our finalists and cohort with our global network of engineers, designers, investors, and entrepreneurs to ensure that the proposed solutions are technologically, environmentally, culturally, and financially sustainable. Our global community of diverse experts works closely with the iShow team to understand the unique challenges of finalists in each region, share critical insights, and select our cohorts. Right now, social entrepreneurs look to iShow for help getting their vetted prototypes to market but we recognize that they also needed help much earlier in the process, moving from the very early concept stage to building a working prototype, a place to explore, develop, and improve the most promising ideas for social impact hardware, even if those ideas are still largely untested or not fully formed. That is why we launched the Idea Lab in 2021 to identify promising ideas to move through a rigorous process and ensure that they are fully viable, manufacturable, and will make a difference. In addition to this, we are also mobilizing a growing global community of change agents via our digital platform and community, Engineering for Change, which you're all on today. ASME founded E4C over a decade ago with other leading associations, and it is now our leading digital platform, knowledge organization, and global community of more than a million engineers, designers, scientists, development practitioners, and others who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by vulnerable communities. E4C's perspective cuts across geographies and sectors, including ICT, energy, water, sanitation, transport, health, habitat, and agriculture, providing pathways to connect, learn, explore, and freely access critical knowledge and networks to advance the social sector. E4C members access news and thought leaders, insights on research and hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and unique opportunities to contribute their skills to the social sector. The global mega trends of shifting demographics, digital connectivity, and technological advancement are reflected on our members today. Most of them are from India, followed closely by the United States, Pakistan, Nigeria, and the Philippines. They are young. Approximately 70% of them are under the age of 35, and they are technically trained as engineers, scientists, architects, and designers, and a significant percentage of them are women. What this data tells us is that young, diverse, technically trained people, particularly in emerging markets, are seeking to apply their skills to apply, improve quality of life for their communities and beyond. Now, as I mentioned, E4C is powered by ASME, and that would not be possible without the visionary leadership and champions of individuals such as our current president-elect, Karen Oland. I'm honored to introduce ASME's president-elect to you all today. She is the Associate Director for Finance and Operations at the Princeton University Art Museum, where she provides strategic leadership, strengthening, strengthening and sustaining the process for planning management. She has experience as a biomedical engineer in industry, academia, and government, most recently as the research manager for How Medica Inc which is an orthopedic implant manufacturer. She is a recipient of various ASME awards and a member of the Engineering Honor Society Tau Beta Pi 
and the American Society of Engineering Education, Orthopedic Research Society, and the American Society of Biomechanics. Karen received her bachelor's degree in engineering and biology from Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania and has a master's degree in anatomy from the University of Chicago. We are very honored to welcome Karen to the stage. Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yama, and hello, everyone. As president-elect of ASME, it is my privilege to welcome you to this important discussion on preparing the future engineering workforce to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I am so proud to lead an organization with such a prominent footprint in the sustainability space. I'm sure I don't need to tell all of you how critical and imperative this is, not only for the future of our engineering community, but for human beings everywhere, especially those in underserved regions of the world. Addressing the UN SDGs is one of the most visible ways that ASME fulfills its mission to advance engineering for the benefit of humanity. And given the enormity of the technical challenges we face, humanity needs qualified multidisciplinary engineers now more than ever before. Within ASME, there are two key drivers for this work. One is ISHO, which Anna referred to, our signature hardware accelerator competition which kicks off next week on May 10th with the first of our three regional events, ISHO India. I invite all of you to log in for this exciting event. The second main driver of our sustainability work is our Engineering for Change organization, E4C, which is funded by the ASME Foundation and the Campaign for Next Generation Engineers. We'll be hearing more about this amazing work in just a few minutes. The goal of AS Means philanthropic programs, including ISHO and E4C, is to empower the next generation engineers. And there are two main ways we accomplish this. By increasing access to the engineering profession for those who are represented in it, and by supporting engineers to build a more sustainable future. As you will hear, E4C helps us meet both these challenges. More than half our prestigious E4C fellowships are awarded to women engineers. So in that sense, we are directly addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the engineering profession. And our million member E4C digital community is a powerful knowledge and networking resource for engineers who work to solve the UN SDGs. So you can see why I'm such a big believer in ASME's global development work and in all that ASME is doing to build a workforce that will lead the world towards a more sustainable future. Thank you all for being here today and for your commitment to this cause. I can think of no better use for an engineer's talents than contributing to a cleaner, healthier, more productive, and more sustainable world. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much for that welcome, Karen, and for your own commitment to this work. To introduce myself, I'm Jonathan Kemp, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's discussion. I'm a technology focal point for the MGCY Youth Science Policy Interface Platform and Program Associate with Engineering for Change and with the Engineering Global Development Department at the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. My background is, one of, is being one of the early career engineers who has been, been prepared personally by one of the programs we're discussing today, having been part of the Engineering for Change Fellowship alongside the work that I was doing at the time as a technical manager for a community development organization in southern Malawi. I'd now like to introduce and hand over to my colleague and co-moderator Carolina Rojas, who will also speak on behalf of the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth's uh, Science Policy Interface Platform. Welcome, Carolina. Thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction. Um, it is an honor to be here representing two organizations that I'm passionate about. So four, four years ago, I got engaged with the MDCY uh, through E4C in their efforts to involve E4C fellows with the UN system. And ever since I'm passionate about the role engineers can play in the science policy space. So this year I have the pleasure to be once again interfacing between both organizations through this side event. Uh, as Jonathan, I am also a technology focal point for the MDCY and I am currently program associate at E4C. 
the ESPI platform uh, is excited to be co-organizing this event with Engineering for Change and having this dialogue today with other organizations supporting early career engineers to pursue meaningful and impactful work in sustainable development. I want to give our audience a bit of a background about the MDCY and the SPI platform. The Major Group for Children and Youth, or MDCY, is one of the recognized stakeholder groups that engages young people aged 30 and under in certain UN processes related to sustainable development. As a youth-run organization, we have organized youth participation at the UN Multi-Stakeholder Forum on Science, Technology and Innovation since its inception, and we are excited to continue to do so this year. Currently, I specifically contribute to the MDCY as a technology focal point uh, for the Science Policy Interface Platform, or SPI, which is a global network of young people working at the intersection of science, technology, policy, and diplomacy within the UN system. The SPI platform was created in 2016 as a cross-cutting platform of the MDCY that focuses on stakeholder participation, capacity building, knowledge generation, and dissemination and youth action in science policy spaces. We would like to recognize that this event is happening at the UN STI Forum. We want to acknowledge the role of engineers and architects, as well as scientists and innovators in achieving the 17 sustainable development goals. The relationship between science, engineering and policy has become an increasingly important component of sustainable development within the United Nations system. It provides a foundation for evidence informed policies facilitates the use of science as an enabler in policy implementation and review, and provides a unique scientific lens into monitoring impact. The United Nations Global Sustainable Development Report, written by an independent group of scientists, clearly states that science does not exist in isolation to society. We as scientists and engineers have also the responsibility to contribute our insights to pressing issues and political deliberations about the future we want and need for people and planet. We also need to recognize that although you young scientists worldwide are mobilizing solutions for sustainable development challenges through networks as the SPI platform and others, many young engineers are still entering the workforce without support or knowledge of how to apply their skills towards sustainable development. And so we feel it is vitally important to convene spaces and discussions that foster cooperation between, um, amplify the work of organizations that are taking steps to prepare young engineers to engage with and address the sustainable development goals. Today, we are bringing together different actors who are enabling the workforce development of young engineers and scientists needed to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and 2030 Agenda. From the S MDCY and the SPI platform team, we want to thank you for joining us today. I now hand it back to Jonathan for some housekeeping items and start our panel discussion. Jonathan, you might be muted. Thank you so much. I apologize for that. Uh, thank you so much for those words, Carolina. Uh, we want to start now with a few uh, important housekeeping items before we get into the panel discussion. Uh, let's take a moment to practice using Zoom in the Zoom chat window. You can find that at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, so please click to open that and then type where you're joining us from. If you're joining us through the UNSTI Forum's Hoover platform, you will see two chat windows, one on the right hand side uh, for Hoover and another from Zoom. But we prefer if you use the Zoom platform just so that we can uh, get everyone uh, speaking together. I'm seeing a number of different people now. We've got uh, visitors from Peru, uh, people joining us from various uh, cities in the US, uh, states like New York, Oregon, uh, places in like Egypt, Canada. Uh, I'm seeing Ecuador, uh, more uh, cities in the US, uh, Rwanda, Madrid and Spain, Ghana. Thank you so much for joining us from this wide range of different places. It's wonderful to have such diversity of people here today. Uh, 
I'm personally joining from Lantaya in Malawi. Thank you so much for doing that. Now, as we get into the panel discussion, if you have any questions for the speakers, uh, please use the Q&A window. You can find that just next to the chat window at the bottom of the Zoom. Um, and if you have any technical challenges, uh, please reach out uh, by Zoom chat to uh, James Creel, who's the administrator of this uh, meeting. Our panel will begin with our panelists sharing about their background and the work their organizations are doing to prepare the future engineering workforce to achieve the SDGs. So I'd now like to introduce our first panelist, Pritam Malor, head of the Emerging Technologies Division at the International Telecommunications Union, specialized United Nations Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. Welcome, Pritam. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Pritam. Perfect. Uh, so uh, thank you, MDCY and ASME uh, Engineering for Change for inviting me to this very important conversation. Uh, my name is Pritam Malor, and I'm the head of the Emerging Technologies Division at the ITU. Uh, the ITU is the specialized UN agency for information and communication technologies. You know, it's, uh, for those who may not have heard of the ITU, uh, it's the oldest UN agency. So we are 157 year old. Uh, you know, our, our mission is uh, bringing mini meaningful connectivity to the world, which includes, uh, you know, capacity building to bridge the digital divide, tech policy, you know, tech standards, spectrum management, you know, areas such as AI, cybersecurity, quantum, fintech, many, many different areas that we uh, work in. And as you can see from the bio on the screen, you know, I'm one of those who started out as an engineer, uh, working more than 10 years purely as an engineer. And then I realized I was interested in the bigger picture. And I, I guess that moment of epiphany has struck many of you who are participating here. Uh, so I wanted to learn, you know, and do more about the impact uh, on the impact of these technologies, you know, uh, they, uh, that they were having in general, uh, positive and negative impact. So I decided to do something about it. And so I got a second degree in engineering and public policy. Uh, the University of Maryland College Park had this master's program in this area. So, uh, you know, I, I, I joined that. That led to the ITU as this is the main UN body that works at the intersection of technology and public policy. And of course, Geneva is a very cool place to live. Uh, so having the exposure that I've had here, you know, I, I don't regret this for a second, my decision to move from a purely engineering role to my current role. Uh, so uh, here, uh, you know, I, I would like to uh, talk about one initiative, uh, you know, uh, that ITU is uh, uh, has uh, you know, as going here, uh, and because it's on AI, and this was my expertise in a previous life. So, uh, and also this is the major UN platform with more than forty agencies as partners. It offers several opportunities for young engineers from all areas of expertise to contribute. So here's the presentation. Uh, let me uh, jump to that. All right. Uh, so AI for good. Now it's a leading UN uh, platform for UN action on AI. It's been organized by the ITU since 2017. It's co-convened by the Swiss government with more than 40 agencies as partners. So what is AI for good? You know, for us at the UN, uh, AI has the potential to positively impact all 17 SDGs. And we're seeing many examples, you know. We also recognize that there are many challenges in the application of AI, which requires putting in place guardrails, be it ethical, human rights related, trust and security, protection of worker rights, many, many different areas. So, uh, you know, simply put, uh, the goal of AI for good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the UN SDGs and to scale these solutions for global impact, you know, and doing all this in line with UN core principles. Uh, of course, it's been uh, said many times, and I think you will hear this message again. We have less than 10 years to achieve the SDGs and we are lagging behind in many, many areas. So we need to leverage all the technology and all the expertise we have out there. Uh, next. Next slide. So uh, as you can see here, you know, practically the entire UN system is part of this effort. So for young engineers uh, you know, out there and the engineering associations, you can rest assured that you know, for your field of work, the branch of engineering, be it telecommunications, civil, nuclear, mechanical, agriculture, you know, um, the UN agency whose work is directly relevant to your area, 
is very active in uh, using AI applications in its efforts. Next. So um, uh, we have a whole range of products and activities. I only have uh, three or four minutes in total. So I'm at, this is just a snapshot. You know, in practically every group, we welcome expertise from young engineering professionals. Uh, Innovation Factory, for example, which showcases startups working in this intersection of AI applications and the impact on the SDGs. Challenges such as the machine learning and 5G challenge, you know, which is targeted towards young researchers in the field. The webinars where you can learn more about what's happening, the latest breakthroughs, you know, the coolest applications. Also talk about your work, you know, in, in many, many different areas. And all this is open to all stakeholders, you know, governments, private sector, technical community, universities, research institutions, civil society, you know, it's open to all. So uh, just like ASME, ITU also develops technical standards. We're the only UN agency which does that, I think. And uh, so we have many technical groups, you know, looking at topics such as AI and health, AI for autonomous driving, AI and uh, natural disaster management, machine learning and 5G, of course, AI and Internet of Things for digital agriculture. You know, all these are in collaboration with different agencies, other sister agencies. And these are all pre-standardization groups, you know, so uh, mainly run by academics, young researchers to, again, I uh, invite you to actively engage. And I can tell you how you can do that at the end. Uh, another one to highlight, you know, a resource that ITU publishes annually uh, of all the AI projects we have going on in different UN agencies and specifically uh, which SDGs they correspond to. So here you have a reference guide for the projects you're interested in, you know, and the contact person that you could reach out to in these agencies. And there are more than 220 projects highlighted. So this, this is something that you can rely on. Uh, last uh, slide. <clears throat> okay, this is how you can immediately engage. Uh, we have launched a community platform for you to you know, directly engage and contribute. More than 5,000 people are on it. You now we launched it in uh, Feb of this year. Uh, more than 5,000 people are on it, including experts, you know, practitioners, young professionals, UN agencies. So if you're interested, you can directly register at aiforgood.itu.in uh, or you could reach out to me and I'll be happy to help uh, put you in touch with the right team. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Pritam. It's fantastic to hear about this work that ITU is doing and uh, we do think that it will be great for, other, for people to engage with AI for good if they see alignment with their passions. Now, um, our next panelist is Emma Stein. Uh, she's bringing insights around the academic engagement in this space. Welcome, Emma. Hi, everyone. I'm Emma. I'm pursuing a PhD in civil engineering from the University of Colorado Boulder. I'm researching student experiences before, during, and after attending a graduate program in development engineering. I focus on how these experience influence career goals and outcome expectations. I'm interested in how these goal line, goals align with social justice movements, including if and how students and practitioners are addressing global inequality and the SDGs and career pathways, especially now when activists are calling for the development sector to implement decolonized and anti-racist structures. So currently I'm interviewing about 50 students from seven different graduate um, development engineering programs in the US um, every semester. So these students are in different stages within their graduate programs. Some are starting them, some are about to graduate. I'm gonna see them go into their careers. And yeah, and then I'm gonna start interviewing practitioners soon too, to see those practitioners' career goals as well. So then on the next slide, I'm hoping to talk about some of the really common structures that I see in these graduate programs and then some of the best practices that the students I'm interviewing really appreciate or are hoping that their program starts to do. So a lot of these graduate programs use T-shaped in-class learning. On the left, you can see from UC Berkeley, their graduate development program, they have this T-shaped um, structure where maybe a few classes go over a breadth of ideas within sustainable development. Um, so, as you can see for Berkeley, they're focusing on ethics and reflection, data analysis, and a whole bunch of topics. And then after those classes, you can choose a concentration. And for Berkeley, it'd be like sustainable design, healthcare, AI, energy, water, environment, or self-designed. My school at Boulder, we have an intro class, which is sustainable community development, where we go over what's happening in the field right now, the SDGs, um, past failures, hopes, successes, and then we have a lot of classes that will dive more deeply into specific topics. So we'll have global health, um, data or community appraisal, 
um, development economics and classes like that. So within here, I see best practices when um, uh, <laughs> programs align the breadth classes or intro to sustainable development classes to social justice and how to effectively work on SDGs. This is really our chance to talk about the history of global development, why different communities and countries are at different points in the SDGs, why maybe past development models aren't, very, aren't working super well or when they are working well, uh, what are the root causes for all this inequality. That is a good time to talk about that. Uh, other best practices are when we create spaces that are valuable to students from all backgrounds and knowledge bases. My work is a little limited, well very limited because we're really focusing on the U.S. However, some of the trends we see in the U.S. can be really applicable to other countries. Uh, we have found that scholars, scholars have shown us that students from low and middle income countries and students of color are really, really valuable in the spaces. They bring the navigational, social resistance, and linguistic skills that are very helpful to development strategy. However, we want to make sure not to tokenize those students for their knowledge and make spaces where students from different privileges and spaces and experiences with infrastructure inequality can co-create knowledge. So that's really important. And then finally, we want to find ways to recruit and admit students without relying on gate kept experiences. Something about this T-shaped uh, structure is that it's very helpful if we bring in a lot of students that have STEM backgrounds and engineering backgrounds, because then we don't need to focus on those engineering foundations and we can really focus on sustainable development, what is happening at the moment. However, in the US and maybe in other countries, how students get into engineering programs can be really defined on privileges. And if we only use um, students that come from an engineering undergraduate degree, we might be leaving out a lot of other students who would be very, very valuable in this field. So if we can find, way, find ways for students to circumnavigate an engineering undergraduate degree or get into these graduate programs without a very similar background, it's also very valuable. And then on my next slide, um, one other thing that really unites these programs is that these sustainable development graduate programs often have a practicum or internship experiential learning opportunity. So at my program at the Mortensen Center, we have a practicum that happens over the summer in between your first and second year in graduate school. And here's a little image that shows where all these students are going and what different sectors they're working on. And a lot of programs have something like this. So within this idea, a best practice that we have seen is to have a very diverse array of internship opportunities, including topic, location, and tasks. In the past, maybe sometimes leadership has um, been more specific on what locations you could go to, where people need sustainable development, um, what topics are engineering. But as decolonizing development and as the sector just changes, um, what a future role is for different types of students is really changing. And what we consider engineering is changing where you should be working is changing. So being very open to what students want to work on is really valuable while also giving advice on how to get a good career. <laughs> um, and then we also wanna be creative and providing learning experiences that veer away from neocolonialism. Sometimes we have projects where students have a lot of power over the project or um, control over the money that will be affecting a project when community members really have a lot more knowledge on what needs to get done. Um, so we want to have opportunities for students that veer away from neocolonialism. And then finally, being thoughtful about short-term travel and who is benefiting and potentially being harmed by a practicum experience. This was especially um, easy to see during COVID. Students that maybe really wanted to travel realized that, oh, I can help out an institution but without traveling, I can make connections with different community members and people from around the world without traveling. And my presence somewhere might actually be harmful because of COVID. So it made it really um, clear. So yeah, those are some best practices that I've seen in my research. Thank you so much, Emma. That's fascinating to hear. Um, I'd now like to give the floor to our two panelists with the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, uh, Pukit Kanotra and Michaela Chan. Welcome, Pukit Hi. Michaela. Hi everyone, my name is Polka Kanotra. I am a, a licensed civil engineer based out of New York City. Um, currently, I work at Parsons Corporations um, in the airport design uh, sector. I have experience in water resource management. Uh, I am an early career uh, young engineer. Um, outside of my career, I have a volunteer experience with Engineers Without Borders, uh, along with the, I'm on a, a working group for the Commonwealth Youth for Sustainable Urbanization. Uh, steering committee and also the uh, WFEO Global Young Engineers Working Group uh, on SDG 13 along with Michaela. If she wants to go next. 
Sure. Hi. Um, can we go on to the next slide? Um, so, yeah, my name is Michaela. Um, I'm also part of the WFEO working group with Polkit um, and delighted to have this opportunity to present to you. I'm a civil engineer at Arcadis working in the water sector. Um, I'm also an early careers professional. Um, I graduated in 2019 and I'm currently representing the UK on the Y20 um, Youth Summit in Indonesia on sustainable and livable planets. So, um, yeah, trying to bring in that policy um, experience and creating those pathways. Um, so, yeah, I'll, if we could go on to the next slide, I guess we'll start telling you a bit about what our working group. So, um, yeah, we're a group of international young engineers who are looking to make a huge difference in the world. And we came together through various connections, but with one goal in mind, namely how to create the most impact on SDG 13 um, climate action. And so we've seen that climate action has um, and climate change has had a huge impact on civilization. And we're finding that all the studies and findings are pointing to a really bleak future, especially for younger and future generations. So we're committed to being a voice for young engineers around the world because young engineers do have a lot to say about how to tackle climate change and we're also going to be the most impacted by current climate action policies. So I'll hand over to Paul Kitt to talk a bit about what we've done so far. Thanks Michaela. Um, so what we have done so far is uh, starting last year um, we actually uh, started off the year with uh, an engagement for uh, um, young engineering organizations around the world using WFEO's uh, member uh, site, if you will. Uh, we reached out to engineering organizations around the world uh, and try to create a space for them to, to kind of communicate with each other and, and pass on knowledge that might be relevant to each other's um, countries. For example, that there's one uh, region that is, is combating climate change and other regions policies or their engineering style uh, might uh, help the other side. So we, we try to create uh, a communication network for organizations. Um, mainly, uh, our biggest accomplishment last year was actually presenting at COP26, uh, a joint statement of international youth organizations uh, with partnership from MGCY, um, the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change, uh, Youngo, UNFCCC, uh, Global Youth Network, uh, and the UN Youth for Climate. Uh, we presented a, a climate declaration where we had presented some policy recommendations for public, pu public policy makers um, to kind of um, enact in their public policies. Uh, some of the policy areas that we touched on were mitigation, uh, adaptation and resiliency, inclusive action and capacity buildings. Uh, so we had a, a total of 12 policy recommendations that we've made. Uh, three of them were actually fully adopted in the Glasgow Climate Pact. Uh, those were ensuring uh, a clear uh, roadmap for every sector to implement NDCs or nationally determined uh, contributions to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, we also uh, had uh, recommendations for greenhouse gas and methane emissions mitigation, along with the inclusion of youth capacity development theme in the Global Climate Fund Green Jobs Initiative. So those three were actually adopted. Uh, in the Glasgow Climate Act, seven of our policy recommendations uh, were officially acknowledged and recognized, and two of them were identified uh, to be further discussed in subsequent COPs. Uh, so one this year at COP27 and then the future ones. Uh, some of the other ones, uh, policies that we had recommended uh, were stopping and prohibiting exploration and development of new fossil uh, fuel projects. Uh, ensuring meaningful and inclusive participation of local communities in the creation of national adaptation plans. Because a lot of times we've seen that uh, governments uh, send, tend to create public policy without input from uh, local uh, communities, which are going to be mostly impacted by them. So it's very important to include them. Um, also, we wanted to support the creation of new jobs and development of skills, especially for younger engineers, which kind of calls into capacity building. We wanted to make sure that the youth were involved in um, creation of these new green jobs, as Michaela mentioned, because the youth are going to be the ones who are going to be mostly impacted uh, by climate change. Um, if you can please go to the next slide. I just wanted to uh, highlight some of the, the signatories that we had. We, we were able to um, get uh, uh, endorsements from uh, quite a few organizations, including uh, Yango, uh, Science and Policy Interface, uh, Engineers Without Borders International and Australia, uh, Engineering for Change. Uh, also, someone to note was Charles Hendry, who was the former minister 
uh, for business energy and clean growth uh, in the UK, uh, Resilient Shift and World Young uh, Scientist Summit. So all of these people uh, helped push our, our, our voice out uh, to the world. Uh, as you can see in the photos, uh, that's kind of our panel from our committee members uh, who presented uh, our declaration. And we actually had on the ground uh, committee members passing out our declaration uh, to different policymakers. Uh, one of the photos is uh, was one of our committee members, Carol's, who's giving our declaration to Mr. Nigel Topping personally. Uh, he's a, a UK's high level climate action champion who was appointed by the prime minister. So our, our, our ragtag group of people got together and were able to make a, a quite an impact. So it, it's been quite an amazing year and I'll pass it on to Michaela to talk about what we're gonna do next. Yep, so I think I have probably about a minute left. Um, so I'll just briefly take you through our strategic plan for the year. So as you can see, it's built into four themes. The first being climate policy recommendations. Um, so in this area, we're looking at advocating in four um, sub areas, um, so climate finance, clean energy, capacity building and loss and damage, um, with the aim to attend COP27 later in the year um, and encouraging UN parties to adopt our policy recommendations again this year. Um, and we'll publish the climate action report and initiate the 2023 climate advocacy aims by the beginning of next year. The second area is business environment climate policy. So through this, we aim to develop a strategy and really set up um, industry-wide dialogue with business leaders, emerging professionals, and key organizations in the sector to garner commitments and share best practices. And we also hope to take this to engage with UN parties. The third one is capacity building for youths and young professionals. Um, so we are looking to get engaged with a number of events across the year. Um, starting well um, with this one I guess and um, yeah going all the way up to COP and hoping to engage with different COP simulations to really help to bring young people into policy making and sustainability space. The final one is strategic engagement so we've identified a number of strategic partnerships which includes the UN climate high level champions as Paul Kitt mentioned um, we engaged with them last year but also other WFIO partners um, so institutions across the world and other UN groups um, like the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change and um, yeah, MG, uh, MGCY. <laughs> so yes, I think that's it for our presentation and thank you and look forward to answering your questions later. Thank you so much, Michaela and Phuket. Um, I'd now like to uh, pass on to our next panelist, Brighton Kawama, Global Director of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network in New York City. Welcome, Brighton. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm very excited to, to be here today and uh, congratulations to everybody that has gone uh, already and shared their very innovative and unique uh, work. Uh, my name is Brighton Kaoma. As I've been introduced, I, I am Zambian, but currently leading the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network uh, youth in New York City. I, I lead a global network of over four, uh, four to 100 young entrepreneurs, scientists, artists, and innovators that are working to localize the sustainable development goals. Um, I did my master's at Columbia University, specifically focusing on the uh, master's of public administration in environmental science and policy. But I've also worked across uh, startups, having co-founded a startup in the past using technology to centralize mobility and transportation in Zambia. Um, and I'm going to speak uh, um, about what we do at the STS and Youth, what are some of our strategic priorities, and um, how are we contributing to innovation in the context of the sustainable development goals. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to the Youth Solutions Program, which is uh, one of the three global programs run by SDS and Youth. So founded in 2015, SDSN Youth, which is presided by Professor Jeffrey Sachs, works across youth entrepreneurship, education for sustainable development, as well as urban sustainability. But why do we focus on these uh, three key elements? We believe that by 2030, almost 50% of the global population is going to be in urban cities. So how do we begin to innovate around how we can create more livable and sustainable urban cities. 
So we have a year-long fellowship program that brings 100 young people from over 100 countries that come to design and devise solutions for sustainable cities, from mobility to uh, energy uh, generation. Uh, the Youth Solutions Program specifically looks at bringing together young social entrepreneurs from around the world and taking them through innovation processes from ideation all the way to launching their ideas and innovation. Next slide. So the Youth Solutions Program, as I stated, uh, is one of our three global flagship programs, but it focuses mainly on promoting uh, innovative youth-led projects that are tackling the world's toughest challenges around the SDGs. So the program was launched in 2016, and so far it has worked to support and accelerate 200 plus youth innovations across 170 plus countries. So these young people are running startups and uh, innovative ideas and projects across the 17 sustainable development goals. And what the program really does is to help them embed sustainability at the core of their business models. Next slide. So we've identified through um, our global network that young social entrepreneurs are facing a plethora of challenges from barriers and lack of opportunities to learn innovation or social entrepreneurship to a lack of access to mentoring opportunities and business development services. We've also seen that so many young people, uh, especially those in emerging markets, have got limited access to networks and lack of uh, visibility to opportunities. As that's not enough, we've also seen a lack of shared narratives and SDG alignments with a lack of access to opportunities for them to learn new skills. We've also seen challenges implementing scaling and funding innovations and solutions. So through the youth solutions programs, we've designed a program that addresses all these key um, challenges. Next slide. So our approach in the youth solutions fellowship focuses on providing innovation, training, and mentorship, where we have partnered with a number of different organizations, including Bear, um, uh, World Bank programs, um, at Columbia University, where we provide mentoring opportunities for young innovators and um, entrepreneurs that are driving social enterprise innovations. And we put them into a network of experts for them to gain visibility, uh, have access to funding opportunities. But most importantly, we want to help young innovators align whatever they are working on to the SDG goals. So we have experts that take them through a series of trainings for 12 months before uh, they eventually pitch their ideas and have access to opportunities for funding. So how does the program work? So we begin by scouting and sourcing talent, where we have a call for applications for young people from around the world. And then we get into knowledge building, where the selected 100 innovators go through an incubator program. So the incubator program that we run focuses on building their foundation skill sets. Uh, for those young people who are interested in social entrepreneurship, we, we, we are building a program that builds their social entrepreneurship skills. Um, then we go into mentorship and building a community because we believe that more than anything, having somebody that can guide you and hold your hand as a budding entrepreneur is just as important as receiving opportunities for financing. So we give them opportunities to have access to mentors. These are seasoned SDG experts to seasoned investors. And then we create opportunities for them to pitch their ideas and opportunities. So we get into a pitch context contest where they pitch their ideas. And this happens at the end of each year. At the end of the year, we'll be pitching their solutions to a panel of experts. Then we provide pathways. So the innovators don't just go through a fellowship, but they stay in the network and we connect them with accelerators, impact investors, and other opportunities. And just recently, we launched our Seed Awards, 
in partnership with Monash University, as well as the Queen's Commonwealth Trust, where we're going to be providing more seed grants to some of these young people that are proving to have innovative ideas and um, are in need of a sizable amount of investment for them to scale what they're doing. Um, but from my personal experience, uh, on top of what we are doing at uh, the UNSTS and youth, I've come to realize that as somebody that uh, went through an environmental science program that combined policy and innovation, what is becoming more important more than anything at the moment is to empower young people with a multidisciplinary skill set. Because when you look at sustainability careers and somebody that studied sustainability, all the industries are now looking at ways through which they can reduce cost, increase profit, but at the same time be sustainable. So we're encouraging young people in the STSN Youth Network across 127 countries to think about ways through which, irrespective of their careers, uh, prioritize sustainability in whatever career paths they choose and to help them by connecting them to the right people and the right industries for them to create impacts in their own unique ways. And lastly, every year we organize what we call the Vatican Youth Symposium, where we bring uh, leaders in business and government. And this past year in December, we brought Maya Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, we brought Professor Jeffrey Sachs, we brought um, uh, Nobel Laureate Muhammad Yunus, and over a thousand young people to engage for two days in intergenerational conversations about innovation, social enterprising, the SDG goals and create alliances for partnerships. Um, this year, we are focusing primarily on ways of creating partnerships. And uh, for those that would be interested in working together, we'll be very keen to explore ways through which we can collaborate and partner on a number of the, our strategic initiatives that we're doing at the NSC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brighton. And now our final panelist, last but no, by no means least, to my colleague, Owen Pfeiffer, Research Manager, Engineering for Change. Welcome, Owen. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as Jonathan said, my name is Erin Pfeiffer, and I'm Research Manager with Engineering for Change, where I support our fellowship program. Uh, I first became involved with E4C as a volunteer and then as an expert fellow in the 2020 and 2021 cohorts. Um, my background is in mechanical engineering and renewable and clean energy, and I'm currently based in Oregon. Uh, next slide. As Iana spoke to earlier, E4C's mission is to prepare, educate, and activate the international engineering workforce to improve the quality of life of underserved communities around the world. We do this by providing programs, resources, and platforms that accelerate the development of impactful solutions and ensure public health and safety around the globe. The program that I will be focusing on specifically today is the E4C Fellowship Program. Uh, next slide. At E4C, we have a unique model for mobilizing human infrastructure. Our impact projects framework, which I will speak more to on the next slides, enables our community to contribute their expertise in service of the SDGs. To achieve the objectives determined together with our partners, we assemble and cultivate diverse talent from around the globe. We lean on the insights and the strategic guidance of our global network of more than 1,000 multidisciplinary experts and integrate in our E4C fellows, whom we expose to these urgent issues and train to execute the mix of scholarly work, private sector market research, and human-centered design required to propel the sector forward. This human infrastructure is critical for realizing the SDGs and more. Next slide. To unpack this in a little bit more detail, E4C's impact projects are part of an annual program that brings together our community with social impact organizations worldwide to advance sustainability objectives. Projects are co-designed with diverse organizations ranging from academic institutions, nonprofits, social enterprises, private sector, and multilateral agencies. We have three work streams for our impact projects, which you see here, including impact research, design for good, and advancing workflows. 
Our impact research projects investigate critical research questions at the intersection of engineering, sustainability, and global development. One example of this is a project sponsored by Habitat for Humanity, where fellows identified and analyzed sustainable housing solutions and innovations that would enable circular economies in low-income communities, particularly in Mexico and Kenya. Uh, our Design for Good project uh, assess uh, assist organizations with product design, development, implementation. Uh, last year, we worked with the nonprofit Bridges to Prosperity on a project at the intersection of transport, infrastructure, and data analytics. The project leveraged existing satellite imagery of completed Bridges to Prosperity trail bridges in Rwanda and Uganda to determine changes in the width of walking paths and roads with, within a specified dis distance before and after bridge construction. And then lastly, our advancing workflows projects work to improve system workflow processes to ensure that partners can achieve their impact goals more efficiently. Last year, we worked with the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees to support the implementation of an integrated settlement spatial planning framework focused on the delivery of settlement planning tools and templates as a key component for implementing the framework. These examples are just a few of more than 70 projects to date. Uh, next slide. And it is my pleasure to officially welcome the 50 plus incredible fellows that make up the 2022 cohort this year. This is officially their first week. Uh, typically, we would be um, in New York City attending the STI forum, but today they're joining us at the side event from around the world. Um, to the E4C fellows who are on the call right now, I encourage you to type in a brief introduction into the chat now. Um, the 2022 fellows will join our growing network of multidisciplinary global change agents representing 24 nationalities and a gender balance that is still, unfortunately, aspirational in most engineering classes and professional settings today. These incredible individuals represent the science, tech, and innovation ecosystem and how a digital platform can be leveraged to train a global workforce necessary to achieve the SDGs and beyond. Uh, next slide. So in, in conclusion, this approach that we use at E4C allows us to simultaneously train exceptional rising professionals worldwide, provide a platform for interdisciplinary cooperation and connect a community of thought leaders and peers from every continent. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you to all of our panelists. It's wonderful to hear about all the work that each of you are doing in your respective organizations. We'll now move on to the moderated panel section of the discussion. And given the time, please do put any questions that you have for the panelists into the Q&A. Um, and we, I might ask some of the panelists, please, if you can respond um, by typing to those, uh, that would be great as we proceed through the moderated discussion, uh, just to ensure we get through as many questions as possible. So. It's delighted to have you all here today. Uh, I'd like to begin with um, a question to uh, Emma and to Pulkit. Uh, please, can you speak to the challenges that you see for early career engineers to receive the SDG, to receive SDG and social impact focused training in the academic and private sector spaces? So maybe Emma, you can start for us. Hi. Um, so something I've been seeing across a lot of students is that they really desire some role models that are doing meaningful work, including work that addresses the root problems for why outcomes, including the SDGs, vary among communities and countries. So some of the classic role models and career tracks in large INGOs and government organizations or religious groups and other development organizations um, are now being identified as potentially perpetuating colonial or ineffective practices. And so it's making them struggle on what career track should I go down or what training should I take, partake in. So for example, students are reading books like The Divide on the historical reasons for global inequality, wealth, education, clean water, and other SDGs, and the effect of debt on this inequality. And then they desire some role models of individuals and institutions addressing these deeply rooted issues, which they are, there are some out there, but they would love more access to them. And then I did talk about this a little bit, but I think students really desire creativity and how they're being taught about and practice working on these issues. In the US, our undergraduate and graduate opportunities for getting involved in these problems are often service learning activities such as Engineers Without Borders. 
which is great. I did it. <laughs> um, where students work on a project that aids in the SDGs and then rely on the partner communities to maintain that project. However, there's some outdated aspects to this model, which is very common among lots of organizations. Um, for instance, community-based maintenance as opposed to professional maintenance may be less effective. And sometimes these models rely on unpaid labor of partner communities and may not have enough oversight of local engineers. So just more creativity. So in summary, students want to address inequalities, are concerned with perpetuating colonial models or ineffective practices, and they desire experiences and role models that show how they can contribute to SDGs in meaningful ways. There's my spiel. Thank you, Emma and Phuket. Yeah, uh, hi everyone again. Uh, I think as an early career engineer, uh, the biggest thing that I've noticed is, uh, as far as training is concerned for social impacts focus, uh, you know, study is, uh, there's a lot of training that is very much uh, job function specific, but a lot of training that I, I've seen in, in my um, work, uh, you know, my employment, every job I've worked at, uh, is that they lack interest exploration. Uh, as an engineer who, you know, worked in water resources, uh, I've had um, various levels of uh, positions uh, within different companies, but I was never able to um, kind of ex explore what I was interested in. I personally am in, uh, interested in sustainable development, but I couldn't, I didn't feel comfortable, nor did I feel like I had a space um, to kind of talk to my superiors, to talk to my bosses, talk to HR, that, hey, I'm interested in sustainable development and I would like to explore more training. Most trainings that were provided to me uh, were very much, uh, you know, top level down is this is what my job function is and these are the trainings uh, that one must partake in. Um, so I think that there's there's a big hole that there, there needs to be filled there that if if employees are given uh, space and, and and confidence to to come out and speak up and say hey I'm interested in learning about um, sustainable engineering or I'm interested in learning about uh, water management or, or climate adaptation or resiliency um, is there any training that I can uh, partake in I think that's a very important uh, piece of the puzzle that is still kind of missing in a lot of uh, private sector spaces. And I, honestly, I work in public space sector as well, and it's, it's similar. It's There's not a lot of impetus or a lot of uh, incentive uh, for employers to uh, ask their employees, hey, what are you interested in and how can we train you in that? I think that's the biggest thing. Thank you, Phuket. As we continue to consider the uh, gaps and barriers that are causing, uh, that are limiting young professionals um, to address, to have careers in sustainable development, um, I'd like to address a question to Emma, to Owen and to Brighton. Um, both of your organisations engage with young engineers, architects, and scientists globally through fellowship programmes, helping them to advance the SDGs. So first, Owen, uh, from your experience with uh, the Engineering for Change fellowship programme. Can you speak to what challenges the early career technical professionals are facing uh, to form a career in sustainable development? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so from my experience at the E4C Fellowship Program, I believe some of the challenges that early career technical professionals face around opportunities um, are around opportunities navigating career pathways and a lack of formalized training. Um, and I can elaborate on each of those points in a little bit more detail. So uh, applicants for the fellowship have expressed a lack of opportunities to collaborate on projects internationally, as well as a lack of opportunities to work on projects that have a real and tangible impact in comparison to say like traditional school projects or internships where there may be a lack of this connection to social and sustainable impact. And I think that that's kind of what draws a lot of interested applicants to our fellowship program in the first place. Um, additionally, it's pretty, it can be pretty difficult to navigate career pathways in this space, um, as, as some of the panelists have spoken to. Historically, doing engineering for global development work has required volunteer work, which is a tremendous barrier for those uh, who don't have the resources to go without pay, for example. And one way we try to address this with our fellowship program is providing stipends and also uh, having the opportunity to be, be part-time so that they can continue to work in other jobs if necessary. Um, additionally, we try to provide ample networking opportunities through the projects, um, through our growing E4C alumni network, and then also by engaging with our expert network around the globe. Um, so for example, if someone wanted to work for the UN one day, applicants see that this fellowship could be a great opportunity to further make those connections to make that happen. 
Um, and then lastly, um, I mentioned a lack of formalized training on engineering for global development and the skills needed to be successful for that. So including things like just understanding the sector as a whole, um, design processes, considerations for manufacturing, distribution and implementation, business models um, around social innovation, um, and uh, several more, which are things that we do try to address in our fellowship and our learning curriculum. Thanks. Thanks, Owen. Um, and Brighton, from your experience with the Local Pathways Fellowship Program, can you speak to what challenges young innovators are facing? Uh, to develop impactful solutions that address the SDGs. I think thanks, Jonathan. Uh, so we, we we continue to observe very consistently what some of the learnings that are coming out of these fellowship programs we run with the local uh, pathways fellowship. We bring um, urban architects, you know, designers and innovators, uh, policy analysts to come together and form teams that can address these problems from a cross-disciplinary stance. Because we keep realizing that if we want to solve any of the challenges around sustainability, we don't just need you know, lawyers alone or engineers alone. We need like a multidisciplinary skill set that can contribute to designing all these solutions. So through our local fellowship our pathway, we are addressing that problem by creating teams of young people that have got diverse skill sets. But that's one thing that we've also learned. Uh, young people that are in our fellowships would share about how in their previous experience they found themselves to be in a silo where because they were focusing on this particular career and they would do it indefinitely but they've started realizing and learning that things are evolving you might not just focus on one specific career path indefinitely you might think about ways of diversifying your skill sets and collaborating with others to resolve complex challenges that equally require collaboration. So collaboration is one thing that we've observed and we are bridging that by creating a platform for young people to connect. The other issue, especially for young people in the global south, uh, I come from Zambia, I come from an African country, and I see that in the next, by 2050, for example, Africa is going to be a continent with 1 billion people. But if you look at access to opportunities by most young innovators there, young engineers who are creating solutions for sustainable development, access to say financing is totally different from other young people that are in the, the global north. I live in New York, so I can speak confidently to some of these you know, issues that I've observed. So we're creating pathways of linking them to opportunities to access sizable amounts of investments. We recently launched our seed awards uh, where we are creating partnerships with other organizations and identifying some of the most tangible and uh, uh, scalable solutions around mobility, uh, reforestation, um, and we're giving them opportunities to receive sizable amounts of funding. So the finance financing gap that exists in SDGs is quite huge, and I think it's good to start not treating young careers to be uh, uniform uh, uh, globally. Uh, there is no, uh, they're not homogeneous at all. So we try to look at them as unique cases, depending on where they're from and which part of the world they're from. Thank you, Bison. Uh, that's very insightful. Uh, now we want to, to consider particularly about the current progress that we're achieving and the training opportunities that are taking place at the moment. So preterm, um, two of this year's SDA forum topics of discussion are aligned to, uh, aligned to the, SDG, uh, the SDG 4 on quality education and five on gender equality. Uh, one of today's thematic sessions focused on digital public goods and highlighted the importance of digital connectivity and literacy uh, for development and achieving the SDGs. Given that current efforts from ITU are aligned to these topics, can you share more about the ways ITU is bridging the digital divide globally and building capacity of early career engineers and young people broadly? Sure. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for the question. Uh, it's a you know it's a fairly broad question, so I'll uh, given the time constraint I have, uh, you know, I'll focus my response on one of the major uh, divides, uh, the digital gender divide. Erin uh, also brought that up in her uh, you know in her uh, intervention. Uh, and uh, you know, here, despite uh, some encouraging progress, 
uh, the digital gender divide uh, still remains the you know uh, it, it's prevalent in uh, a great many countries around the world and sadly you know the connectivity divide is widest in the world's ldcs uh, the least developed countries where uh, a large majority of women remain totally offline and it's not just uh, an access divide you know it's also a representational divide within the tech sector you know the tech engineering sector <clears throat> and itu has been focusing in this area for more than a decade for example we have the equals global partnership it aims to help fulfill sdg 5 uh you know it's in, in partnership with un women the international trade center which is another un agency in geneva here gsma which is the telecom industry association and un university uh they are our co leads and today we have more than 100 uh, uh partners across the world you know and what do we do we advance uh, uh, you know uh, we have advanced mentorship and exchange platforms you know such as the network of women i saw a question there about mentorship so i'm just mentioning this you know uh network of women you know women in cyber mentorship and many others you know uh we also uh, you know pleased to co-lead uh, with unicef uh, an initiative called the generation equality technology and innovation action coalition working with uh, un women the governments of mexico and france you know around collective initiatives and investments to support uh, girls digital access skills creativity so bottom line we want to ensure that you know each and every girl and woman in every country around the world gets a chance to leverage the opportunities offered by access to digital technologies and also you know that every young girl who wants to you know uh, uh, gets a chance to pursue a career in tech a sector which has many opportunities not just for personal advancement but also for our communities and our societies thank you jonathan thank you so much pritam uh now Michaela, can I ask you, as a member of uh, the FWEO uh, Young Engineers Group and a practicing engineer, what are some pathways that you've seen for involving young engineers in sustainability and policy spaces? Thanks. Um, I think this is a really good question. So there are actually quite a lot of pathways already existing at different scales, but firstly, they're not necessarily publicised, and secondly, they're not necessarily fully inclusive of young engineers. So I think we probably all see that sustainability is moving towards the forefront of conversation at the moment in the engineering industry and young engineers especially are pushing for this and have a lot of good ideas. I think if every organization started involving young engineers in organizations and um, so sustainability strategy then that would be a really good way of bringing together those diverse teams that Emma mentioned earlier um because I think that is key um to bring that creativity and to solve problems um for the future. um on the other side of the question you also asked about policy spaces so there are a few platforms for young engineers um to gain the skills in like public consultation and policy making for example the youth summits like the Y7 Y20 and youth for climate um but again there are obviously drawbacks to these um i think a lot of people have found that often young people are creating these policies and sharing them with um like officials but often receiving no response and i think um conversations need to go both ways and there needs to be that constructive um conversation that comes following um receipt of the policy proposals and kind of using that as a way to springboard into wider discussions around the um sustainability and policy making so um yeah i think our working group is trying to help to tackle this by kind of creating a space where young engineers can tackle both climate action and policy um on a global scale by engaging very widely with um cop the well cop 26 and cop 27 this year so yeah thank you for your question thank you so much uh mikhaila um and yeah and as we uh, as you were saying with uh with that around the kind of youth summits and that engagement we kind of now want to consider to trans transition to consider how collaboration can be increased Uh, to foster that multi-stakeholder um, collaboration. Um, now, can I ask Pulkit in response to this, um, and also Pritam, uh, from your perspectives and experiences as active members of multilateral organisations, uh, we're interested in gathering perspectives on the role your organisations play in foster, fostering multi-stakeholder engagement and collaboration uh, to prepare the future engineering workforce. Uh, so, Pulkit, 
since the WFEO uh, as an organization brings together national engineering institutions from some 100 um, plus nations and represents more than 30 million engineers, uh, how is the WFEO fostering cooperation? And what role is the Young Engineers Committee playing in creating opportunities for young professionals? Uh, great question, Jonathan. Thank you for uh, the question. Uh, I think the, the, the biggest thing that I mentioned earlier was that uh, with regards to cooperation, is uh, our, our committee itself created a, a space for uh, engineering organizations that may have been disconnected uh, in the past uh, or weren't even aware that there were other ones out, them, out there like them uh, interested in sustainability uh, development um, to kind of create a space for them to communicate and to, to knowledge share. So I think that was one of the main things that we started off with. Uh, I think as far as creating opportunities for young professionals, um, our committee, you know, allows us to be in events like this, uh, to be at events like COP26, where um, our members were able to directly engage with public policymakers. A lot of times in our meetings, we have discussions on how we can make change, what can we do, but uh, the committee itself allowed us to, to be able to directly engage with public policymakers in person, hand them our declaration, kind of give the voice to to all the youth uh, out there uh, young engineers who are working in the space and just younger generations who are going to be impacted who feel a certain type of way about climate change and want to to have a voice in climate action so i think uh, our committee played a huge role in 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 kind of creating an opportunity for young professionals to get involved uh, i think it was my biggest takeaway from that was that as someone uh, who is an early career engineer who may not know where I want to be, how I fit into that space. Uh, I'm able to spend some time and volunteer uh, and I don't have to wait for anybody. I don't have to wait for my boss to give me a task. I don't have to ask for permission. I can go out and seek uh, a committee like ours um, to make a difference, to make an impact, to voice my uh, opinions and voice my, my fears and concerns, uh, quite honestly. So I think uh, our committee is, is quite uniquely positioned to bring together uh, engineers from around the world uh, with different backgrounds, different um, experiences, um, and kind of work towards a similar goal, which I think we all kind of feel. Uh, and I think there, there is a critical mass uh, of the youth who, who want to engage in, in climate action. Uh, so I think our, our, our organization, our committee, uh, is, is a great place for that. I'm sure there's other organiz organizations that people can um, be involved with, and I would you know, ask people to go out and seek those and see how you can make a difference and get involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pukit. Um, and on that topic of uh, kind of organizations that are, that are working together, Fritam, as ITU is the UN's um, oldest agency and a neutral party platform, um, how has it uh, fostered cooperation with diverse stakeholders uh, from the private sector, civil society and public institutions to su support sustainability efforts? Uh, thanks for the question, Jonathan, again. You know, uh, within the UN system, ITU is sort of unique. It's also sort of cool, I think. You know, because uh, uh, along with the 193 member states as members, of course, we also have as part of our membership, you know, and this has been since probably our inception, you know, the private sector. So right now, our membership includes, uh, you know, tech giants such as Apple, Huawei, Samsung, Google, Microsoft, you know, Facebook, Alibaba, you know, all the big guys. Uh, as well as you know, civil society organizations, research centers, academic members from some of the top universities across the world. You know, there are 900 members who are not, uh, you know, other than just our, uh, the 193 countries. And these are actually the ones that lead all the work on ITU's technical standards, you know, uh, bring in the discussions on new and emerging technologies. And also on practically every initiative that we have, uh, uh, you know, it includes the private sector, the different stakeholders, civil society. Just as an example, the ITU's Child Online Protection Initiative, which was launched in 2008, it has ITU, UNICEF, Interpol, you know, civil society organizations such as ECPAD, Child Helpline International, private sector, you know, Microsoft, Disney, many, many others. And essentially, you know, this is true uh, not only at the IT, but, you know, in multi-stakeholder initiatives across the UN. Now, essentially, we've realized that multi-stakeholder is the way to go, uh, primarily because these topics are becoming really complex, multifaceted, you know, not just technically, but also policy-wise. And we also realize that, you know, the expertise, expertise 
spread among different stakeholder groups. So it's important to involve everyone from discipline, different disciplines. You know, if we want these initiatives to have real, real impact. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Pritam. I definitely agree that um, involving everyone from across these disciplines is vital. Um, now, Brighton, can I ask you, um, as SDSN is a connection of networks, um, and those networks are, cover people across those different disciplines and different um, backgrounds, uh, and has built a very successful uh, collaborative model, what are some takeaways that you can share with us, uh, particularly with regards to how you're leveling these networks to train youth uh, in technical fields? Thanks, Jonathan. I think that's a very important question because uh, over the last uh, five years, what has been our most unique selling point as an organization is creating a platform where young people, irrespective of their interests, can come and find a community to belong to. So we have young people that are artists, for example. We have young people who are designers. We have young scientists. We have young uh, entrepreneurs. But by virtue of them coming to STS and youth, they find a place where they belong, a place where they can find people that have got similar interests as them. So creating a platform that creates opportunities for a diverse set of young people who are coming from unique backgrounds is extremely important. But also promoting a space of inclusion. Because when we speak about specific technical and engineering skills, so many young people that are coming from particular under-resourced communities and uh, regions might not have the same level of access to such opportunities. So how do you create a platform where they can also come in lane through peer-to-peer -peer connections and identify areas and skills which they need to develop? So we've seen that through creating this global thriving network, which is very engaging, young people have managed to create um, uh, good opportunities for alliance building and skills development. But also most importantly, what we've come to learn over the last five years is that um, ideas and solutions are very ubiquitous. But what's more important is how do you prepare young people to structure, uh, especially the social entrepreneurs, to structure their models so that they can become more investor ready. And how do you create democracy in accessing all these learnings and opportunities? What we've managed to do and what forms a strong backbone of our work is partnerships. So currently we've partnered with a number of different organizations that have made our work even much easier. We are working with Nova Impact currently to launch our Seed Awards, which we're giving to young entrepreneurs. We've partnered with the Ban Ki Moon Center, where we are working towards um, education for sustainable development. We have partnered with the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in the Vatican, where we organize the annual Vatican New Symposium. So I think partnership becomes important because you can churn young people to other programs and initiatives being run by partner organizations. And I think prioritizing alliance building and collaboration becomes a very strong piece of the puzzle, especially for, for organizations working with youth and children. Thank you so much, uh, Brighton. And as you were saying about the learning that we've got, I now want to ask uh, Carolina to, um, fin uh, to bring us through questions around uh, the future of um, achieving these uh, uh, like these opportunities for young engineers um, and also any live Q&A that we have time for. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, yes, as we are closing, we want to uh, start thinking what can happen next uh, and where are opportunities for growth. So I would like to first address uh, Emma and see if you could speak of what would you like to be happening in the future and also what are opportunities for growth for young engineers to align their work to the SDGs. Thank you. So something I've been talking to students a lot about is that they're really interested in knowing how much agency they'll have in different engineering jobs. So knowing beforehand, um, yeah, how much agency they'll have. Engineering firms can often be implementing projects that really don't align with the SDGs, 
or work against them, and students want input into not doing those projects or changing those projects in some way. Some students go into more specialized graduate school like development engineering because they feel or experience that at more traditional engineering jobs, they wouldn't have the agency to not work on a project that they thought was harmful or research how an initiative will impact um, communities through health, poverty, decent work, or clean water and impact the earth through sustainable cities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, or aiding life underwater or on land. And they wanna have power to change aspects of that project for the better. So if they can know for these more traditional jobs, how much agency they would have or the different career paths to having that agency, that would be super valuable. And then in addition to agency, students are also interested in how companies are addressing inequalities in their work and how they're staffing and partnering with local employers and organizations. Sorry, I'm in a city right now. Understanding the different organizations' visions for alignment with the SDGs and roles associated with doing this would be really valuable for students. Thank you, Emma, for that intervention. Um, as you were reflecting on academia, I would like now to uh, reflect on a workforce development program with young engineers and scientists. So I would like to pass on the word to Erin to see if you could talk to where uh, do you see opportunities for girls and how uh, do you see um, E4C contributing to this space? Thanks, Carolina. Uh, yeah, I think that there are ample opportunities for growth uh, in this space for early engineers and technical professionals hoping to align their work with the SDGs. Um, so besides our fellowship program, which is, um, you know, I've, I've spoken to in depth, um, and also ASMEs, I show an idea lab, which, you know, provide opportunities uh, to support the development of social innovations and uh, the development of innovators. Um, I think that there's also opportunities for growth through collaborative design challenges aligned with the SDGs. So um, a few years ago, uh, there was the Siemens Design Challenge, for example. Um, and uh, something else that I just wanted to touch on with this is that um, something that came out of a project that was sponsored by Autodesk, where E4C fellows looked into the future of mechanical and manufacturing engineering and machinists, um, is the potential for micro-credentialing, which can be used for early career technical professionals to really showcase more easily their and uh, quantify their transferable skills to the sustainable development space. And so I think that this could be um, really helpful kind of in creating more opportunities for in individuals in the space. Thank you, Erin. Now, Brighton, since uh, Erin touched a little bit upon um, moving forward with supporting young uh, professionals in the innovation space, uh, SDSN is closely uh, working uh, towards this aim. Uh, what are some opportunities for growth that you are seeing uh, and, and where do you, would you like this to go uh, in the future? Uh, one of the most thing, one, one, the most important thing that um, I'm, I'm very certain about in my mind is ensuring that even as we discuss creating opportunities and pathways for career advancement for young people, we begin to identify who's left behind. If we are working towards leaving nobody behind, thinking about who are the ones left behind and then working from there is going to promote a lot of inclusion, but most importantly, ensure that we harness the demographic dividends that we are seeing, we are seeing regionally. Because if we don't empower young people with the right 21st century competencies, then uh, I guess we won't be able to attain uh, the sustainable development goals that we are working so passionately towards. So number one is thinking about who are the ones left behind, be it in our workplaces, be it in our organizations, be it in our communities, but also be it in areas where our work focuses and beginning to look at ways through which we can include the ones left behind. Number two is looking at co-creation, collaboration, and cooperation. I think those three Cs are going to allow us to create change at scale. Uh, in designing our programs, focusing on those three things, from co-creating uh, programs that include engineering, um, that include science, technology, 
uh, the arts, um, but also looking at collaborating with other different stakeholders and partners and cooperation. And the cooperation in the sense of ensuring that there is more mutual uh, partnerships and there's more mutual benefits across the different organizations that are working together. Um, also, lastly, I would like to say something along the pathway of linking the best youth-led ideas to opportunities for financing. Because there's so many great ideas around which young people are leading, but we need to go an extra mile in ensuring that we provide pathways for them to access both financing and the right mentorship for them to scale, to scale such uh, solutions and ideas. And SDS and youth is prioritizing such pathways of increasing the amount of financing that is going to youth-led uh, innovations, uh, um, engineering uh, uh, projects from around the 127 countries where we work. Thank you very much uh, for that, Brighton. Um, I know we are at time, but we do want to ask everyone that we will stay for just five more minutes so that um, Michaela and Pulkit and Preetam can also reflect briefly on where they would like this to go forward and then we'll have our closing remarks. Uh, I'll pass on the word to you, Preetam. Uh, where are opportunities for growth or where would you like this sector to go forward? Thanks, Carolina. So uh, from where I sit, I think uh, you know, we, we are creating uh, abundant opportunities. You know, the SDG as a framework is flexible enough that it offers every organization the opportunity to align itself with one or more areas that you can trace the impact of your work. Uh, and thanks to the advocacy effort by the UN through, you know, events such as the STI Forum, the Visus Forum, which happens at the end of the month, and many others, the awareness is there. You know, uh, these are open platforms where everyone is welcome, can participate actively. Uh, of course, I understand that it's sometimes difficult as individuals to engage. I've seen that in the chat also. You know, that's where the engineering associations, such as ASME, ACM, IEEE, and many others, you can play a crucial role because, you know, these associations have the means and the broader perspective of what's happening. And all of them, almost all of them, I guess, are already engaging quite actively with different UN agencies. You know, and, and you should rely on them to... Uh, Guide, guide your young engineers to areas that they can contribute. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you, Preetam. And then finally, I located Michaela from the WFEO perspective and um, young engineers. Um, what would you like to see happening in the next uh, few years? Um, yeah. um, I can go, I guess. Uh... I guess the, the biggest area of growth that I see as a young engineer is, I think starting off as an early career engineer, I don't know if people can relate to this, but I had a lot of confidence issues in my skill set. I didn't know if what I was bringing to the table would be enough. So I think what's really important is kind of um, a need for exposure and, and PR, if you will, for young engineers that they have the ability, they have the capability. Uh, we go through a lot in engineering school to get to where we are. So I think creating an environment which encourages and enables young engineers to kind of disrupt the status quo, if you will, where we don't have to feel um, less than or that our voice doesn't matter is very important. I think empowering young engineers um, to kind of request projects which maybe align with their interests if it is with SDGs um, and finding different ways uh, to allow young engineers to voice their uh, ideas to be incorporated into projects. Uh, personally, I've seen incorporation of um, sustainable utilization of construction materials or recyclable materials uh, as an idea that was thrown out by someone and then it was incorporated and it can actually end up being cost effective. So I think giving space to young engineers to, to be able to uh, find alignment within their work that aligns also with SDGs is, is quite important and is a, is a huge opportunity for growth. Thank you. Yeah, I think I completely echo what Paul Kitt said. Um, and yeah, I think finding those spaces is particularly important. I think having those diverse um, converse, like diverse voices in conversations is really key. And I think everyone learns from them. It's not just young engineers who gain from that, but people who've been working in the industry for years. 
Um, linking on to what you said about confidence as well, I think it would be interesting to see more of these soft skills highlighted in university courses and other occupational training. Um, so for example, negotiation and communication skills, because I think that a lot of young engineers do come out with really good ideas from their university courses, but don't necessarily know the best way to engage um, like the wider community on it. And I think with, with a bit more opportunity to develop those skills earlier on, rather than having them later, um, when kind of when you need them already, um, I think that will really lead to a big change in the conversations that we have as engineers. I want to thank everyone uh, for all of your uh, interventions and reflecting on how we can move forward. I would like to pass on the word now to Jonathan for the closing remark. Um, we're sorry to the participants that we couldn't get to the Q&A, but we'll try to answer your questions uh, via email or um, um, when we publish this in our website. Thank you so much, uh, Carolina, as, uh, for moderating with me, and thank you all of our panelists. It's been a delight to have you to have you here and to hear about the work that your organisations are doing, but also about the work that um, you're helping to advance to prepare the young engineering workforce for the SDGs. It's been excellent to, to kind of go through that range from considering what the challenges are to what's actually working now, how collaboration is being achieved, and uh, the visions for the future that you all have. Um, that I'm seeing, hearing really excellent things around um, cooperation, collaboration and co-creation, um, around increasing the spread of ideas um, and really how even different organisations can cooperate uh, and work together to um, succeed and amplify and uh, achieve the multi-stakeholder collaboration that we're looking for. Uh, on behalf of EFC, I'm very proud of what we've been able to achieve over the past decade. Um, in terms of bringing together the global community of change agents that are assembled here at this site event. Um, and I also just want to highlight that none of this work would be possible um, that EFC does without uh, the support of ASME's leadership, the ASME Foundation, um, who are working tirelessly to support the work, our amazing partners, expert networks, sponsors, and the small but uh, mighty team that I'm privileged to be a part of. Um, I want to thank again Karen Olin for the uh, remarks as ASME's uh, president-elect that she shared at the beginning. Thank you to all of you for attending. Uh, it's been a delight to have you here, to have your questions, uh, many of which have been answered uh, through the Q&A feature. Um, and thank you so much to all of us, uh, excellent speakers. Best wishes for the rest of the STI forum. We're looking forward to virtually seeing you all there. Thank you.